<laughs> Good morning again, lovely beings. Thank you so much for being here with me every weekday from 9 to 10 a.m. Mountain Time. Just for a few minutes as we start our day with a simple practice of remembering love. I'm Pamela Erlin. I am a being uh, who channels. Um, I channel angelics, Christ conscious beings, and many different beings and Christed stories that all support and inspire people. Thank you so much again for being here. Um, in this series, I am reading from this sacred text called A Course of Love by Mary Perron. When this author um, worked through this oneness text, um, she had it strongly impressed upon her heart by uh, the being that you know of as Jesus to write this. And she simply, um, well, channeled his words. She wrote his words. So I read it. Um, I practiced it. I took a long time to digest it before I realized that it was something that I wanted to share with you. And as I'm sharing it with you, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, we're stopping to allow moments for Jesus to channel words through me, um, just to sort of deepen the text for you, if that's even possible. There's not a lot of possibility to make this text any better, but definitely to deepen our experience of it. And that has happened for me with his help. So... I noticed that when I was reading, you know, he came to me and started kind of explaining it to me and helping me deepen it for myself. So I figured he would do the same for you. And that's what we've been doing together for the past few weeks or so. We are on chapter two today of this one here. So many of you have been asking, am I going to also do the Course of Miracles? The answer right now is probably yes. I'm still sitting with that one. <laughs> Um, the Course in Miracles is sort of a book that came about at a time when it was needed to break through mind patterns. Um, it was interesting because the language of it was for people just awakening, awakening out of religions and all sorts of constructs at that time. And we're in a different time now, right? I believe this one was published in 2019, even. It was like not, not too long ago. So I find this a little bit more relevant. It's the same principle, but more relevant with the current um, very high frequency manage, uh, energy of language that we need today. True. So this is why I love this one and wanted to do it first. Um, oh, before I forget, on Friday, I'm going to be doing a trans channeling of Jesus for the first time in a year. I think I haven't channeled him publicly since 2020. So if you want to join that, just go to patreon.com forward slash Pamela Erlin. All tier levels, one through five, can see it. And you just watch it later if you don't get to it right now. But it'll be there in a couple days. Okay, 2.5 of chapter two. That's where we are if you're following along with your own text. It's a good idea if you are a visual learner. It says... If love cannot be taught but only recognized, how is this recognition made possible? Through love's effects. For cause and effect are one. Creation is love's effect, as are you. To believe that you are able to act in love in one instance and act in anger in another, and that both actions originate from the same place, is an error of enormous proportions. You again label love a sometimes component and think that to act in love more frequently for more frequently is an achievement. Oh, I just realized I didn't put in my microphone. Um, <laughs> I'm going to put that on there now. Some of you are saying sometimes that you can't hear me. Hopefully you can hear me better now. You again label love a sometimes component and think to act in love more frequently is an achievement. You label acting from love good and acting out of anger bad. You feel you are capable of loving acts of heroic proportions and fearful actions of horrific consequence. Acts of bravery and acts of cowardice, acts of passion you call love, 
and acts of passion you call violence. You feel able to control the most extreme of these actions that arise from these extremes of feeling. Both ends of feelings are considered dangerous and a middle ground is sought. It is said that one can love too much and too little, but never enough. Love is not something you do. Love is what you are. To continue to identify loving correctly is to continue to be able to be unable to identify yourself. Let's read that again. To continue to identify love incorrectly is to continue to be unable to identify yourself. And he capitalized S in that. He stops this here and he says, this is a condition taught to you, again, by your cultures, religion, education, parenting constructs, that all creates the mind constructs. It takes a while to undo that. Please be gentle with yourselves. Miracles are apparent. Love often isn't without the recognition of the truth, the truth that you are love. If you can recognize that is the first miracle the miracle that will be so palpable in your awareness and it will nag at you. You will feel its truth under your skin. And for the ego, it makes you want to crawl out of your skin when you believe that you are body. The ego doesn't like the feeling of this miracle of awareness. This is the first miracle of awareness that can permeate the thought and cause it to realize love. You are the love that you are. You are creation. If I was created in love, and I am, then you must be. This means you weren't born into sin. This means that sin itself is a human construct. Sin is even misconstrued. The mind will take anything it can and misconstrue it to identify again and again with unworthiness and to deepen its core within you. You are here because you are tired. You are here because the suffering that is the effect of that thought stream, the result of this error, is very fatiguing. Rest easy now. This course is energizing. I love that message. <laughs> Let's continue on here in 2.7. To continue to identify love incorrectly is to continue to live in hell. As much as highs and lows of intense feeling are sought by some to be avoided, it is in the in-between of passionless living that hell is solidified and becomes quite real. He stops us here. He says, if you're feeling, you will remember that death isn't possible. If you're feeling, you will remember the joy of innocence when you believe in illusion of birth. You will remember the grace that is present when a mother looks upon her child for the first time and sees only the innocence of love from God's creation that is so apparent in that moment. You can remember that feeling apathetic is the only impossibility in your current state. Apathy isn't a reality. Even fear is stronger. Many who seek neutrality and call that peace when coming from a state of despair and woe are in danger of the joylessness that follows as a result. The result of what? Of believing apathy as a truth. Of confusing apathy with peace. Let's continue. It says, you can label joy heaven and pain hell. 
and seek the middle ground for your reality thinking. There are more than these two choices. A life of little joy and little pain is seen as a successful life. <laughs> for a life of joy is seen as nothing more than a daydream, a life of pain, a nightmare. He stops us here and says, You have forgotten that joy is possible. When you feel it, you find it fleeting. Because it has been considered and taught to be so opposite of the mind's mechanical practicality in your illusions, you don't cling to joy as a possibility at all. And when you are joyful, you'll find that people say, what's that? You're happy? Well, why? What are you smiling about? Why are you smiling right now? You will be told your joy is inappropriate or untimely or even wrong. This path comes with an initial feeling of separation when others do not understand I urge you to continue. Uh, 2.8 is where we are now, and it says, Into this confusion of love's reality, you add the contents of your history, the learned facts, and the assumed theories of your existence. Although your purpose here remains obscure, you identify some things you call progress and others that you call evolution and you hope you have some minuscule role to play in advancing the status of humankind. This is the most you have any hope of doing and few of you believe you will succeed. Others refuse to think in terms of purpose and thereby condemn themselves to purposeless lives. Convinced one person among billions makes no difference and is of no consequence. Still others put on blinders to the world and seek only to make their corner of it more safe and secure. Some shift from one option to the next, giving up on one and hoping that the other will bring them some peace. To think that these are the only options available to creatures of a loving God is insane. And yet you believe to think the opposite is true insanity. Given even your limited view of who you are, could this really be true? He stops us and says, the reason for this pattern of thinking in your collective constructs is you've been taught that there can only be one truth. And while this is true in the Course, the truth is love. There are many paths to this realization in your unreality. When you seek to find this definition or interpretation to be true and then thereby make all the others false. If you believe one being is awakened to God's self and thereby all others are not, you close the door to God. You close the door to the awakening and awareness of both the stillness and movement of grace. It becomes less apparent when you give yourselves only one path to walk. It's not the high ground, the low ground, the middle ground. Even that concept obscures the possibility of a way that cannot be understood by the mind. I love you.